Okay, last and last. Um, we're going to go go uh, go back a little. Well, a little bit. Uh, what we've been looking at before was what kind of uh, normal stresses were caused in beams by simple transverse loading on prismatic beams, and we're going to. We're going to still keep that in a sense, um, as we've been looking at just some kind of simple loads, whatever they did. We, we, for the last week or two, we haven't been too concerned with just what that meant, what, what the loadings themselves were, other than we needed to know, of course, where the maximum moment was. We'll, we'll even come back to that in some more detail in a little bit. But what we're concerned with was the response of that beam because of internal moments causing, in the usual case, something like this, causing uh, a lot of compression in the top of the beam and um, tension in the bottom of the beam, uh, the, the interchange between the place, between that, had very much to do with the shape of the prismatic beam and we found that that was right at the normal axis. What we neglected in there is the fact that there are still shear stresses on these beams. We only looked at the moment. So now we're going to look at the internal shear stresses, what those cause in, uh, in the prismatic beam. So we're going to uh, have to pay attention to the fact that, uh, that there's more things going on in these beams than just the simple compression and the tension that we had with, uh, with, the, with the simple bending. Uh, the easiest way to explain it or to, to illustrate it is to imagine we have a beam made up of different uh, different layers like that, as if you just took a couple boards, put them, stacked them together, and that was your beam. If you just leave it like that and apply some load to it, some simple load, you can get a very different response to the beam from the beam if you allow these pieces to you know, if, if you didn't glue them together, if you just simply stacked them and then applied your load, you'll get a very different response to that than if you had said, say, uh, glued them all together or capped the end or whatever it is you wanted to do with it. Easiest thing to draw is, is if we cap that end to, to uh, hold it tight there. Um, you can see this very type of thing. If uh, we imagine this book as a beam, it doesn't have much structural integrity when I leave it free like this. There's just not that much. It's almost the individual strength of each paper itself that offers the integrity. But if I clip the ends, then it's a much stiffer beam. The, 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 the comparison between the two is, isn't even close. Do you want to show you pass it around so you can see it? It is, it is pretty, pretty remarkable in how easily it now bends. So we need to look at the effect then of these shear stresses here. We're going to see that that has a great deal to do with whatever shear stresses are along those different planes. Because it's that, that this bonding that either prevents this shear stressing or the, uh, the free picture of it that allows it. DJ, you didn't like that? I think it's did you Did you take a good view? You did not. You didn't. I shook it. And that was but, that was together. Okay. Uh, I don't like a regular All right. All right. So, uh, if you remember, we did look at this some. If we pull out a little piece of that element there, 
we did look at the shear stresses on those elements. We found it to be because of the, uh, the different types of uh, static equilibrium restrictions we had, both moment and forces had to be in balance. If you remember, we came up with this type of shear stress where all those shear stresses all the way around that little element were of the same magnitude. Uh, you might remember that from, I think, second week or something we did that. Okay. So, we need to, uh, we need to do a little bit more of an in-depth look now. Uh, this type of thing only in, in better detail as we look at these shear stresses and in these beams that we're going to look at. All right, so imagine some loading of some kind. What it is isn't uh, exactly important other than the fact that we know what it is and that at any point we can find out what the shear stresses are in the beam. Then we can uh, start to analyze just what's uh, what's going on here. So, so here's here's a greater view of the beam in side view. This is not a, an end view here. We're going to have to be careful. We know which view we're looking at. So, we'll uh, take a little section in the beam of length delta x. Remember this generally x is our axial direction. Y we tend to take up and then z in and out of the board. So we'll continue with that as before. And uh, whatever the whatever the cross section of this beam is, let's uh, make it prismatic but not necessarily rectangular. So we have the neutral axis. From that shape in our experience, we know that the neutral axis will be then a bit lower, lower down, something like that. And so our little piece of interest here that we have is delta x, y. In the cross section is going to look something like this. We're going to take it as going all the way across all the way across the uh, the beam itself. We're not going to look we're going to look at that entire piece in some detail. So we need some other um, other points of interest. Remember the maximum distance from the neutral axis to the outer bit of the beam we call it distance C. Any intermediate distance in there we call Y. And this part of the cross section that's shaded we're going to call kind of a big script A. I don't know why they picked that, but they do. For area, I guess. That's the area of the cross section above a distance y from the neutral axis all the way to the edge of the beam. All right, so we're going to now uh, change our view once again, just because we're having so much fun with these drawings. Jay, huh? Mm -hmm. DJ. So here's the, here's the beam in some perspective. Here's our little piece running across like that. So it's, it's real important you get this whole picture in good, uh, good view so you know what we've got here. All right. So to make it bigger now, here's the side 
look, it's the same picture here now expanded. So this is delta x across there. It has a whole area, dA, sort of missing, mixing our infinitesimal and bitesimal finite uh, elements, but uh, we're just looking for a picture here of it to see that, make sure we get, we know what we're getting. All right, so it's got a load. There, depending on where we are, if we were right under this uniform part, it looked just like that. Um, we want to account for all of it, though. So that's whatever that load curve was times that delta x. It's that delta x is small enough so that no matter what the load is, it's it's uh, essentially uniform across that piece. We're not going to try to make this more difficult than it is. Um, other things, let's see, we, uh, we looked just the last couple weeks at what the normal stress was. It is linear down to the neutral axis, so we can draw that in. Looks like that. Uh, just to help us a little bit, we'll call, oh, why does the book do this kind of stuff? I never thought of that. We'll call this, this point C, this side C, this side D. I don't know why they use a C for something like that when we've already got a C. So this would be the stresses on the D side times the area that's acting on. So that'll be the force on that side. We've got the same kind of thing on the, on the other side. So we'll call that total force there, sigma C, DA, that's the normal stress on the C face, times DA. What else were we missing? Oh, and then we have the shear stress on the D face. We haven't looked at that for the last two weeks or so, so that's what we're looking at now. That's the shear stress on the C face. And then the point we've been trying to get to is this that we call delta H. That's the shear stress. along a horizontal plane. That's why that H. And that's the difference in that beam I showed and of uh, taking that book and putting the clips on it of whether or not we hold those, uh, all these fibers going down this face together or not. So it's the shear face along each of those, those fibers or planes or however you want to call it. So we'll sum all the forces in the x direction. They must be zero. So let's see what we've got. Uh, we've got delta H. That's the shear stress Actually, it's not the shear stress, the shear stress, the, the shear force, actually. Since if it was a shear stress, we'd have to measure it by, uh, or multiply it by the area on which it's acting. So, sorry, that's the shear force along there. And this is what we're trying to determine, how much 
uh, shearing is going on along the plane of the, the beam. So we've got that, uh, plus we have uh, C going in one direction, D going in the other, other. So if we integrate over that whole area, the shaded area, that's the DA in the two of these. So that will be sigma C minus sigma D because they're in opposite direction, DA, and then integrate over that whole area here because that's where those, sh those normal stresses are acting. two little things here, remember, we already know, M, C, uh, sorry, M, Y over I, that's what we've been working on for the last week. So we get that now delta H, this shearing force uh, along, all the way along the underside plane of this in the uh, horizontal direction there then equals, uh, let's see, M is constant, that's uh, the loading on the beam, I, this is the entire cross section, if you remember, with respect to the uh, neutral axis. So those are constant as well, so that comes out. We get, uh, solving this, m over i integral of, wait, no, I want to, yeah, I do, I was, we're, we're looking at each of these different places. So this is gonna be m, d, minus mc over i. They may, the, the moment, remember, can change with x, but over the face it's constant, so that then leaves then just the yda behind. Yeah, and that i is over the entire cross-section. That piece there is the first moment of area of this shaded portion. First area moment of uh, what we are calling that A there. It's not the first moment of area of the entire cross section, just that, that uh, that little portion here with respect to the neutral axis. Um, so that's that's the values of y that we're putting in there for the integration. All right, we're gonna we're gonna speed that up a little bit in that we're gonna call this Q, big capital Q. Big capital Q is defined as Y bar A for that big script area that we've got there, where Y bar is simply the distance from the neutral axis to the area centroid of this. Uh, pestle shape, the big script A, times the area of it. Okay, we're getting close, we're getting close. Um, now we're going to use the fact that we know how to relate 
the moments to the shear themselves, and it's just shear we're trying to figure out what we got going here, or delta m equals v delta x, because the delta m is what we've got right there. So it's pretty useful to now pull all this out and we get then delta H, that horizontal shearing force, internal, horizontal, and axially, actually directed down the, down the uh, length of the beam. Okay, all the pieces are there. So I've got V, Q, over I. Because that was delta M, so that goes V delta X. The big Q, remember, is that first moment of area. And then we've got the delta X that's there. So we've got almost all the pieces. The only thing we could do now to make it a little bit easier is this is the delta H on a little piece of a delta X. So if we just divide through by that, we get the horizontal shearing force per unit length of beam is VQ over I. horizontal shear per unit length. Which is uh, useful because it can tell us uh, uh, just how much uh, either adhesive or actually a mechanical fastener like a nail we'd have to put in to actually fasten this. So we'll we'll do just that with an example. So I introduce to you my brown colored chalk. Does that show up okay? Looks realistic. No wait, you, I'm not even done yet. That's just a brown colored outline. Wait till I draw in the the grain of the wood. It just pops. Yeah, can you can you see it? You you'd think with this kind of realism, you would think you were at Disney World. I did. <laughs> you don't even have those stupid 3D glasses they give you. I mean, it just practically jumps out at you. All right, if we were making a wooden I beam like this. Our concern is for these surfaces here right there and right there because if those aren't fastened well enough when the beam is loaded then we get that type of thing that we saw where the the different layers just split apart there's no support from that so our concern then is uh, do we either glue this or would we put some nails in? And if we put nails in, how many should we put in? You're gonna nail that top plank to the bot to the to the intermediate thing and you want to put in enough nails that it'll actually do some good that this shear force won't be so great it actually shears those nails because it's that shear force right through the nail that's giving us this concern now that we're looking at this so you want to put in enough that it'll actually do some good but you don't want to put in so many that it's a big waste of money time and effort to do so
but we can look at that now. We now know the shear stress per unit uh, length. So let's just put some numbers on this and do it. We'll say this is three boards, each of them 10 by 100. Uh, sorry, 20 by 100. So that makes that web height 100 as well. We want to find the uh, delta H in a single nail. How much shear force is going through per nail? Because you have to see if a nail can withstand that. We need to know the, the shear strength of uh, nail. It depends on what they're made of and of course their own cross-sectional area. We'll also say that uh, this distance here between nails will say either either that's the type of thing we need to calculate or check. So let's say we're just going to check and we happen to know it's 25 millimeters. So that is then our delta x in this problem. There's one nail per 25 millimeters, so delta h over delta x. Uh, will be then how much is in one nail. Alright, so we have to do our usual analysis of this uh, and we'll say for the purpose of the problem that we anticipate a 500 Newton maximum transverse shear someplace. So that's V. Q, remember, is, uh, well, let's see if you do remember. What is Q? The first moment of area of the beam, part of the beam, beyond the plane of interest. Remember in the first picture, well there it is right there, you can sort of see it in ghostly fashion there. It was this upper area here. That's our A, and our Q is the first moment of area of that. It's that entire piece there, because that's the amount of the beam, that's the area, cross-sectional area of the beam that's beyond the plane of interest. Plane of interest is that junction between the two uh, planks there where we need to determine what the uh, horizontal shear is. Okay, so Q is pretty straightforward to find. It's uh, for nice regular shapes like this, just Y bar A. With respect to the neutral axis, remember. Nice beam like this, we already know that that's got to be right down the center because of the symmetry of it. So Y bar is the distance from the neutral axis up to the area centroid of that hatched area A above the plane of interest. What's that distance? Be 60. We have 50 of the web, and then halfway through the upper plank is 10, so that's 60. And then this shaded area is 20 by 100. And that number is what? 120,000. millimeters cube. So we have V, we have Q, we have delta X, we just need I as the last little piece. Remember I is of the entire cross-section. 
so we have uh, one of those and two of those. We have to figure out the uh, moment of inertia for each of those. So for that piece I labeled one, its moment of inertia, area moment of inertia is 1 12th bh cubed. So that's 1 12th, 20 millimeters times 100 millimeters cubed. Right, that's uh, so that's piece one. Then piece two is one twelfth bh cubed, but it's turned sideways, so its b is the hundred, its h is the twenty. So that's cubed. That's its centroidal moment of area. Oops, that's not an equals here, that's a plus. And then remember, since it's off the neutral axis, we have to do the parallaxis theorem AD squared. A is 20 by 100, and D is. 60, and that's squared. All of these units, uh, millimeters, so that they match together. So let's see, that's AC, that's AD squared. Okay, so far? What about this what part of the web, or this part of the beam down here? Same thing. Due to symmetry, it's got the same moment of inertia as the piece above, so we just merely multiply by two because there's two beams. So that's two times piece two. And is the white bar negative for that section though? Would they cancel? Uh, no. Uh, the the D I guess technically is oh, negative, yeah. but it's squared anyway. Oh right. Okay. Um, there is no strict uh, Y bar piece in here. This is just the moment of inertia no matter what the shape. And so that number comes out to be sixteen point two times ten to the minus six. meters cubed. All the numbers I put in were millimeters and then transferred that to meters cubed. Um, which I, I don't know why I just did. I guess the numbers come out a little bit better later. So now we have V, Q, I, and delta X. 500 newtons. What was Q? Did I write that down? Oh, there it is right there. times 10 to the minus 6, that's from the millimeters into the meters cubed. All right, that looks okay. Over the 16.2 times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the fourth. So that's VQ over I, all in consistent units. I think everything's okay. Meters, Q, meters. See, that'll give us newtons per meter. How much horizontal shear we have per unit length of the beam 
but then we have a nail every quarter of a mil quarter of a meter and so we put that in that's the delta x part and now we've got then the last of it. This is delta x per nail. And so we know that there's 93 newtons of shear in each one of the nails. Right at that interface. So we know we need to get nails big enough to withstand 93 newtons. If we want to put them 25 millimeters apart, we can put them less close together but use bigger nails. Um, typically, of course, gluing will help with adhesives, uh, especially if you get Gorilla Glue glue, because it's um, awesome and amazing. If you've ever, ever, ever tried it. You're not getting anything apart when you put it together with Gorilla Glue, that's for sure. All right, so that calculation is fairly straightforward, hopefully. All right. The, uh, the biggest places to make mistakes, uh, it's pretty straightforward what V is in these problems. It's the same shear we've been using the same transverse shear we've been using uh, ever since the uh, first or second week. Delta X is usually fairly obvious because either it's given as the distance between the nails or if you're just going to use an adhesive all the way down there or even welding, then you're more concerned with Delta H over Delta X. So the biggest places to make mistakes are on the Q. So just as a reminder, that's the first area moment of that shaded part of beyond the plane of interest. And remember, it could go either direction. And then I is the moment of inertia of the entire cross-section. That's the two places where students are most likely to make errors in this because the, uh, the, the V and the delta I are generally pretty, pretty straightforward. If we're concerned with a long beam, don't forget this could be V max which means you could protect it for the maximum shear and then it's overprotected for everywhere else. So it might be economical to uh, concern yourself with uh, a different nail spacing along the length of the beam or something, however it shakes out with that problem. All right. Uh, that's the shear force determining the shear stress. If we look at the beam on side, take a cross section delta x. Here's whatever plane of interest we might have had in that problem. Uh, for instance, uh, in this last problem, it was just where the, the planks joined together. And if we look at the prismatic cross-section of the beam, right at that place, then that delta x part is there. And that then is our part of the beam right there. 
We need that because this shear stress is spread along an area that's delta x by t y, where t is the thickness of the beam at that point. For our beams, it's always it's constant all the way down. So then we can calculate the average shear stress, which is that shear, that horizontal shear over some delta A, which we've had, let's see, delta H is VQ over I, delta X, same thing we had there, and the area over which that's acting is T delta X. It's the, it's the uh, bottom face there, because that's where that shear is acting. So the delta x's cancel, and then we get vq over i t as the average shear stress on that face. It's not perfectly uniform, um, but it does give us the average. We do have to be careful if the maximum is significantly larger than is the Then is the uh, average. So if here's here's that that area there exposed. The shear stress distribution on that uh, down the face might look something like that. So we have maximum shear stresses that might be significantly greater than the average shear stress. shear stress so we can look at a, a couple problems then. okay so given a beam here simply supported eight feet there four feet there a uniform load four hundred pounds per foot 
there, and then a point load of four and a half kip at that uh, end point there. The beam cross section is simply uh, rectangular. Three point five inches in thickness of unknown height. You're to determine that with these allowable stresses. Allowable uh, shear stress 1.75 ASI. Allowable shear stress 0.25 KSI. All right, so you need to find then the uh, maximum H. Remember that this allowable normal stress is wherever there's the maximum moment. It's not uniform down the length of the beam as we know from our experience. Times C over I. And then the allowable shear stress. Well, we just came up with that. Uh, in fact, it's a rectangular beam, so we can use the 3V over 2A. So you need to find out where the maximum moment is, where the maximum shear is. And then make sure that you have an H that protects for either one of those. Probably easiest thing to do, if any, is find out what H is from here. And then check it in there make sure that you're still below the allowable shear stress. All right, just to speed you up a little bit, I'll give you the reaction forces here. Remember, you'll need that. In fact, we can very quickly do the shear stress diagram. find out where the maximum shear and maximum moment are. The reactions are, uh, actually this one's down. Point six five kip. And this one's up. Eight point three five kip. All right. So with that, we can pretty quickly do the shear moment diagrams. Uh, this reaction's point six five down, so we know that we come down 0.65 then the slope of the shear is the slope of the load diagram minus the slope which is minus
times 400 pounds per foot. Then we jump up by 8.35. By the way, that takes us down to 385 kip. And then we jump up by 8.35 kip. Takes us up to where? 4.5 kip, because that's what we then finish with. It's a little out of scale, but we know that our maximum shear is now the 4.5 in the second quarter, third of the beam. Not quite to scale, but it's the numbers we need, not necessarily the picture. And then the moment diagram. Oh yeah. Actually, you don't need the moment diagram. We know that there's zero moment at the two ends. And all we care about then is the change. Yeah. 